Welcome to this recording of the Activist Lawyer podcast brought to you from the Granite Podcast Studio in the heart of Newry City. We are delighted again that you could join us at Activist Lawyer where we will be discussing a range of topical matters engaging not only with lawyers but people who are committed to highlighting and combating injustices and inequalities. We will bring you our thoughts and invite you to share yours. As always, we're looking for contributors to our blog, www.activistlawyer.com. And we want your perspective as we unravel and unpack a whole host of issues. So people are <laughs> going to be delighted to hear Jack is back. Yeah, Jack's back. And um, that should be the new hashtag for the for the podcast. Jack it's is good to back. be back. Don't sound very excited. I do, anyway. I do, I do. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, I'm Sarah Henry, I'm an immigration solicitor here in Newry County Down, having previously worked in a number of human rights organisations, and Jack is... A master in law, a ma- doing a master's in law oh, at Queen's. Hmm, not quite a master Not Definitely yet. not a master in law. Jumped um, in the gun. Yeah, um, so yeah, back, back again. And what else are you? Uh, I am the legal assistant to exactly. Sir Henry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> had to get oh, that one in there. You had to get that in. Anyway, we're a bit giddy today. I think it's just because we're very tired and exhausted after having a break at Easter. Um, but we thought it would be a good opportunity to connect with our listeners again, uh, just the two of us, thinking back to our very first podcast that we did here. We've had so many guests since. It's mm-hmm. been fantastic. And... We wrapped up our last series with Gráinne Taggart from Amnesty International, Northern Ireland. That was a really great podcast. We've got loads of fantastic feedback. And we covered a lot of women speakers for International Women's Day in March. And that went on for about a month. Yep. And yeah, so we're looking back. First episode was Insults and Inspiration, where the whole concept of activist lawyer, lefty lawyer, do gooder came from yeah so we're going to touch on that a little bit today and um speaking about the power of language in respect of the new immigration rules so a little bit of immigration today and we cannot uh, cover today's show without mentioning a few of the topical issues in the news particularly in northern ireland that we will get to but really it's just to check in say hi say jack is back and to um maybe chat about what we have coming up for our listeners so Jack, how have you been doing? I've been doing well. Jessica's out the door. Jack's back in the door. Sorry, <laughs> Jessica. Um, I think she's happy enough. But yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing good. Easter's over, and time to get time to get back. Time to get back. Back into the swing of things. An interesting fact about Jack is that sometimes you'll find him up mountains running at all hours of the night. Yeah, <laughs> get early. Get it. Get it done early. Um, like to go for a wee run in the morning before work. So if I sound a wee bit tired. The morning? That's, yeah. Okay, so I suppose one or two or three o'clock is the morning in some cases. I think you were at that carry yeah, on for yeah, a while yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> honoured for six o'clock in the morning. But yeah, no, good, good. Crazy, strange person. Anyway, so Jack, you have been doing your job <laughs> <and> looking into <laughs> research and immigration matters. And we're back again to uh, the Home Secretary and the Conservative government. Uh, really relating back to our, our previous uh, blog on um, what's been happening there. And of course, the new immigration rules have been introduced. So we'll talk a little bit about that now, um, just for our listeners. Yep. So while I was doing my job, um, Pretty Patel on the 24th of March announced our new firm but fair immigration rules. Firm but fair. Yeah, that's the new tagline that they're going for. They love it's cool wee taglines. But yeah. uh, so... I'm not a stickler for detail, so just a, a brief description of the of the new immigration rules is that it's a, for asylum seekers. So they've brought in these uh, the new laws that mean that asylum seekers who enter the UK through what they have called now illegal routes or irregular routes mm-hmm. um, will face deportation. Um, and they will not be granted permanent protection, even if they are eligible for it, mm. just based on the way that they, enter. they entered the UK. Yeah, just how they entered the UK. this is good. Surely it cracks down on trafficking. Yeah, it, it doesn't push people to mm. seek other other routes in, okay. well, in their eyes. Um, so, as we were saying there, we've come full circle from the first episode, uh, Insults and ins- Inspirations and the Importance of Language. 
And as I've, as we've seen, um, the misled racist and right wing comments that used to be reserved for the Facebook comments or mm. the audiences of such papers as uh, Daily Mail Online mm-hmm. or right right wing Facebook groups now coming from cabinet ministers, mm. uh, cabinet members without hesitation or thought. Yeah. And twenty twenty one we're in, but we're still the UK is still carrying on the legacy left by Nigel Farage and two thousand and sixteen Brexit Britain. Um, but they're now stepping into territories, and we'll talk about it later, about breaking the Geneva Convention. And that's, mm. that people have been criticising now these new rules and how they're really, really, they're stepping on the toes of the Geneva Convention yeah. and international protections. Yeah, so there's been a big spit on it, of course, um, from the Home Office's perspective, that this is, you know, what the people have voted for, and it will actually improve the whole immigration landscape make it easier for people and you know lawyers and the like have been looking at that and saying absolutely not it's really treating people as commodities and a real lack of respect there Um, and a real lack of understanding as to how people get here and the whole you know uh, journey of an asylum seeker Mm -hmm. and lots of misrepresentation going on but the most recent press release that really struck me um, someone had tweeted it and I can't remember who it was but they were having another shot at activist lawyer and it was trending a little bit there um, they also used the phrase was it dinghy chasers? dinghy chasers, yeah mm, by mentioning the increase in modern slavery protection claims between 2017 and 2020 so there were hints at those who you know, prevent the removal doing of their job seekers, yep. yes um, but they also mixed phrases in and conflated it with uh, phrases like child rapists, Mm -hmm. failed asylum seekers and those who threaten national security. Well, what a mixed bag. The Home Office has not only ignored the use of facts, so I think lots of barristers went to town on this, didn't they? Mm -hmm. But they've also failed to distinguish between fail to distinguish even that is just you know between rapists and those who pose a threat to national security and failed asylum seekers so the report that i'd read had been um relating back to 12 sets of chambers of of barristers and some independent barristers had lodged a complaint and raised this they were so angry about it and rightly so and one of yeah i mean we follow the Secret Barrister, yeah. you in particular love Lo- The Secret love Barrister, you've yeah. read the books as well, yeah. um, got involved with with their critique, so what? Yeah, so The Secret Barrister, who is one of my idols, idols. I don't know if it's one person or two people or three mm. people, but love them, probably the only book that I've read in the last maybe five or six years is The Secret Barrister's Do we two know books. if it's a male or, fa- or like I don't know. We don't know. We don't no, know. I don't know. Okay. Um, but so that he's or he or she has come out and mm-hmm. in defence of the new laws and basically accused the government of dishonest hashtag fake law propaganda mm-hmm. which is wholly contradicted by the facts um, and he's pointed out that the claims they've used to back up the new laws are baseless and the rise in referrals, as they've mentioned there from 2017 yeah. to 2020, is not because of lawyers. lawyers. Exactly. They're blaming yeah. people going to lawyers on lawyers, which, mm. doesn't, which doesn't make any sense. No. But yeah, he's, he's uh, not held any punches. But it ties in with our original conversation where there was just this spin on blaming lawyers. No, it wasn't just lawyers, which is why this cam- um, podcast here came about. It was activists, campaigners, people who were you know, p- providing a service to the vulnerable mm-hmm. and those in need and legal representation, which we know that everybody's entitled to. But anyway, um, I think that will just continue. That's their vein of um, their train of thought at the moment, and that's what they're basing everything on. But the timing of the new immigration plan, I mean... You know, instead of celebrating 70 years since the United Nations Refugee Convention, the Home Office have introduced a system that's been widely criticised by humanitarian groups, both within the UK and around the world. A number of groups have highlighted this new announcement creates a two-tier system designed to punish a refugee based on how they got to the UK, so how they arrived. And there's always been an issue with that. I mean, I've been practising, used to do asylum law years ago, and that was, you know, how did you get here? And why didn't you stop in the first country that you came to? So Mm -hmm. this has always been an issue, and it's been relied on by, I suppose, authorities um, as a way to deter applications and a way to refuse applications. That's pretty common. 
So putting it into basic terms, an individual who arrives in the UK through a regular route, if successful, will be granted the right to remain permanently, obviously, if their case is successful on, mm-hmm. on the whole. But if that individual entered the UK via an irregular route and successfully claims asylum, they will be given a temporary protection, which puts them in limbo, yep. doesn't it? And risks removal um, with limited rights to family reunification, benefits, etc. So to add to this, um, there are cuts to legal aid, local services as a result of austerity, and they've completely buckled refugee advice services. Well, that's been going on for years now. Yeah. Um, and we've discussed already with some of our guests the threat to legal mechanisms like judicial review the rule of law all of that seem to be at one stage there up in the air and still hasn't really been resolved but it, again it's the use of language that uh, the, the government choose to use mm-hmm. so and so they're they're placing they're placing a person's right under international law to be protected by the uk government just on how they enter the uk Mm-hmm. And as I said earlier, this in direct conflict with the 1951 Refugee Convention, as it states that there is no illegal route and that everyone in need of protection should be able to claim mm-hmm. asylum. So them saying that there is irregular or illegal routes, the new laws that are coming in, is l- completely in contradiction to that yeah. convention. Um, and under the new rules, Pretty Patel is basically expecting somebody um, who is in direct danger in a, in a country and she is, expects them just to get up with her passport, go to their ne- nearest airport, get on a plane, and just come to the UK mm. to open but this arms. Is a but statement. that's not how it works. This is a statement of we will, you know, the sovereignty argument all through Brexit, we will protect our borders, all of that. This is that coming into fruition. So, of course, the language they're going to use represents their initial campaign upon which Brexit was based. So, again, immigration being used as this way to, you know, show the EU that we're the boss of our own country, which you always were, yeah. essentially. And, the, and, the, and they use the <laughs> like, same language as well. So yeah. in, uh, we'll go back to the Secret Barrister's books, to, to support Brexit, they were using this rapist, mm. EU rapist that couldn't be yeah. deported because we were part of the EU, and now they're using the same same language for refugees. It's It's just like it's all from the same playbook. They mm-hmm. need this specific language that will hit somebody because mm. child rape is, is, a, is a big deal and they feel like if they use that sort of language they'll get support no matter what, even if it's not even if it's not true. And having child rapists in the same breath as a failed asylum seeker and not distinguishing specifically, it's just very, very dangerous. Yeah. And somebody did actually do a freedom of information request on the, do you remember the initial home office um was it a little video that they shared on Twitter? On I think Twitter, it was yeah. removed. Yeah. Um, it looked like kind of a dad's army map of these arrows pointing or going out of the UK. I can't remember which. Yeah. But what we do remember is the use of the word activist lawyers. And he did an FOI request. Not sure who it was, but they uh, shared it that Pretty Patel had actually signed off mm-hmm. on all of that, which was later so removed. Thanks. thanks, Pretty Patel. So there you go. I don't know if she needs some uh, royalties or something from this uh, podcast then for signing off on that term. No. No. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, activist lawyer. Um, we're coming into spring now. We have a new series coming up. Uh, what have we got lined up, Jack? So we've got a range of guests coming up. We're on episode 16, I think, now. 15, oh. 16. So for the next guest coming up, mostly lawyers to discuss a range of issues. Racism in Northern Ireland. Uh, the new vision of a shared island, which has become... A, a big topic, big topic. Um, and again highlight the work of some important activists in the UK and Ireland not just activist lawyers but activists the, ter- the term activists um, and we're finally getting around to reviewing some of the student blogs it's been great seeing lots and lots of blogs coming in yeah. by different students um, sent us from aspiring activist lawyers around, around the world, the world. Yeah. we've been really lo- and you just learn so much just from reading them yeah, what yeah. people are studying and working on in their own countries it's yeah. so fantastic and different viewpoints from students yeah. from other parts of the world like that you didn't even that no. you didn't even think of but we're finally getting around to reviewing some of them so hopefully that they'll be going great. out soon and thank you to everybody who sent those through and also to the universities and colleges for sharing it. We had really great feedback from colleges who shared it within their groups mm-hmm. and all the rest to encourage their students who are interested in activist um, activism and also human rights matters to get in touch. So if you would like to um, send something through to us, you can check it out on our web page. Yeah. OK, so that all sounds great. And we, again, as I said, we had fantastic guests last season. 
And we're chatting today in our studio here in Uri, I suppose. And we can't really, I mean, I've the Irish, hold on, the Irish Independent sitting here in front mm-hmm. of me. And it's open at a page about, obviously, two pages covering the rioting that's happening um, not so far away from us, down the road in Belfast. <coughs> and it reminds me of some of the chats we've already had here from fantastic guests like Emma D'Souza and Reverend Karen Sitheraman, who are currently, if you go on Twitter around this issue, providing really excellent commentary on this to help people understand. And also, I know... Reverend Karen is actually putting herself out there. Um, yeah, I was saying that out in the streets uh, last in night. In the street um, to kind of curb this rioting with hundreds of other fantastic community activists that mm-hmm. are really, you know, saying, well, we're, if there's no leadership here, we're going to take hold of this <coughs> ourselves. So it's very unsettling and very disturbing. The images have been shared around the world. And for people like me, my generation, not that old, but... This really is just depressing. It just harks back to a very kind of dangerous, unsettling time here that we were all used to because we, we knew nothing else. And I mean, I saw a girl from Newry, where we're from, on Twitter, and she uh, spoke about the summer of riots in Newry. Now, you won't remember. I hate nope. when people say that. Now, you won't <laughs> remember this because <laughs> you're too young, but uh, you will not remember. And there was a burnt out fish truck that stank for days on end and they they didn't um, remove it from the main kind of entry route and road into Newry and we had just lived on that road so we witnessed that going on for days on end but again it wasn't that extraordinary to us at the time I know younger family members of mine were absolutely horrified and really disturbed by the images that they saw and very scared little children Mm -hmm. so that's what I was thinking last night of god we thought we escaped this and I was watching the news and my child who's seven was watching it saying you know what's going on where's this and couldn't relate that it was in in the same country you know and it's unfortunate that it's outside her dad's primary school where he teaches which is actually very worrying but Jack you were born 1997 so a year before the Good Friday Agreement um, was enacted. So we're going to take your thoughts in a second, but you've been watching all of this. Yeah, what do you think? can't be ignored. Um, so yeah, I was born in 97 and the Good Friday Agreement was signed in April 98, I think. Um, so yeah, people people are confused. Uh, and if you're not from here, it can be very confusing. Like I've had a couple of messages from, from people out of my course and stuff that aren't from here and are asking why is... Mm loyalists out um rioting or protesting and why is it and because they're saying that it's because of brexit but they voted for brexit mm-hmm. and they wanted brexit and it's, it's very confusing but just a wee explanation if you haven't seen what's been happening in belfast and other other areas in northern ireland um in the last couple of days i think it's we're in the seventh night now mm-hmm. eighth night yeah. eighth day of of riots but it's a. Uh, this has led to seventy-five police officers who've been hurt and several people arrested at the moment, um, and it's been across different towns and cities in Northern Ireland, and it's ju- that number is just going to go up if this mm-hmm. carries on. Um, the violence involves primarily gangs of young people, and I've seen vi- a couple of videos of people throwing petrol bombs and stones, and mm. they look like they're about eleven or twelve, yeah. um, and they're throwing them at property, the police. We've seen a very viral video going about of a bus yeah. being petrol bombed and driving down the road. Thankfully, Terrifying. the bus driver wasn't injured. Um, as we know, Northern Ireland is split up into s- split in sectarian lines between loyalists and nationalists. Uh, the media is portraying that these riots largely breaking out in loyalist areas, however, they've spilled now into nationalist areas, mm-hmm. are because of the NI protocol which essentially was to prevent a border between the north and south. Mm-hmm. So they've moved the border for checks and stuff yeah. down the RC, mm-hmm. essentially. And loyalists believe that this is separating Northern Ireland mm-hmm. from the rest of the UK. Um, that on top of talks of a united Ireland all adding up and exploding over the last and the flames in the yeah. last few months this has been really sim- more than that it's yeah. probably been simmering hasn't it and then on top of that you have the PSNI coming out and saying that they're not going to be charging anybody for attending the Bobby Story funeral 
that came out a couple of days ago, then all of this has yeah, come out. Okay. And the, so there's the, a lot. Yeah, it's all adding together. The rats are as well because loyalists believe that there's a two-tiered policing system now. Mm-hmm. And because of nobody being charged at all, has just added up. And over the last couple of days, it's just exploded. Okay. But this isn't just about one single issue. And you're right. I mean, there's people you said in your group chat or your student group chat there that don't know. And they're right. I mean, it is confusing. But with people in, in the UK, right? So Northern Ireland, obviously, mm-hmm. part of the UK. And who genuinely have no idea why or what's happening here. And you can see it on, on social media. You know, somebody was commenting today, but it's unionists and they supported Brexit and, you know, they support the Queen, yet they're burning buses. Is this because of Brexit? So that narrative is being bandied about. And um, other people are saying, you can see people getting defensive. Well, if you're not from Northern Ireland, don't comment. But on one hand, we want we want people to know what's happening mm-hmm. here and not just keep it so insular and among ourselves. So I think the fact that it's being shared is a good thing. However, with everything else, the media are not getting it right in many cases. Yep. And there's huge gaps in reporting. So everyone's fired up. Yeah, so on Twitter, there has been the hashtag going about on the Explore oh, yeah. page, Brexit Riots, and I think that's... It's trending today. I yeah. saw that when I got up. Brexit Riots, yeah. Well, it's not really... I mean, you know, and I can see Springfield Road where some of the riots, that's also trending for Northern Ireland. But that's, again, there's much more to it. And that's what I'm saying. There's a misrepresentation in the main, mainstream media in particular. So... It's not as simple as groups of loyalist teenagers, you know, throwing bricks at the police in response to Brexit. We all should remind ourselves here as well, and this confuses the issue even more when people will say that Northern Ireland did not vote for Brexit. Um, And the Democratic Unionist Party, who represent many of these communities, did support Brexit. So (laughs) therein lies a lot of the confusion across the water. But other suggestions towards this surge in violence includes this kind of propagation from loyalist military gangs. I think you touched on it there. And responding to recent police clampdowns and criminality within the area. So we just don't know yet, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's a a a combination of things. I know these 12, 13, 14 year olds that are going out and are being videoed throwing stones and petrol bombs and stuff, I don't think their main concern is uh, Larry coming over from the mainland UK to Northern Ireland being checked. Yeah. I don't think that's their main the main concern. I think it's a, it's a combination of things. Mm-hmm. The community in general, the loyalist community in general, feel like they've been betrayed by the UK government, mm-hmm. who they pledge allegiance to, who mm-hmm. who they support. I feel like they've been, they feel like they've been betra- uh, betrayed. I feel like there's a combination of coronavirus lockdown. Yeah. This whole like everyone's honed in, everyone is sitting at home, and tensions are flaring, and it's just boiled over. Um, yeah. And then the DUP, who is the main party in Northern Ireland, who supported Brexit, who signed the NI protocol, um, I think loyalists feel like they've been betrayed by the DUP yeah. as well, that they're splitting Northern Ireland off from mm-hmm. the rest of the UK, and then the talks of United Ireland as well, it's yeah. just boiling it's over. Fan in the flames. But okay, every leader has called for an end to the violence, so we can mm-hmm. see that. It's kind of easy to say, you know. Oh, it's easy to send out a wee tweet. Yeah. But it's not enough, it really isn't. And really what we're seeing here is that this violence is indicative of serious underlying issues that needed to be redress- addressed within our communities, wherever you're, you're from. Yeah. And the lack of leadership in this country is startling. Yeah. It really is. There's back to the old tit for tat, green versus orange politics, and even the first minister, the leader of this place, said that obviously she condemned the violence, but she says that wasn't it, it took away from the real lawbreakers, lawbreakers Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin, who yeah. of course are the opposite Republican uh, party here. So who else? Some unionists are blaming Boris Johnson. Yeah, some <laughs> blaming Boris Johnson. English people are blaming Farage, I saw today. Yeah, there's. I think everyone is all. pushing the blame yeah. on other people. But we have to forget that, we can't forget, sorry, that those communities feel abandoned. As I said before, housing issues, social unrest continuing after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, serious criminality concerns, and the list goes on. But the tensions have been heightened to a degree that we haven't seen, well, I haven't seen in years. I've heard my dad, my mum, tell me stories of the troubles, as you were saying. 
about all these different riots and trouble going on, but we haven't seen it as a young generation. I, I feel like in my generation, the flags have dropped, the barriers have dropped, yeah. and only now when when violence begins that you really see the split in mm. communities because my generation, that split has nearly completely gone yeah. and you're only reminded of those tensions when yeah. something like this happens. Um, and we've seen more commentary from the English press, high-profile people and government figures on the matter before. Um, Is this because of social media, though, do you think? Yeah, so for Obviously, days, when I was growing up, you were you could only access the press via paper and what was on TV, and you'd no input into that. They published whatever they mm -hmm. wanted. Yeah. But now, oh my goodness, this whole, everyone's involved in commenting. So it can, it's overwhelming. I had to switch off last night. I said that you yeah. could not look at it anymore. But uh, is that a good thing? I mean. Uh, you did, for the first couple of days, you did not see one mention of these riots in main UK based mm. media outlets. Um, I think the only time that I had seen something on the BBC was BBC Northern Ireland. The rest of news outlets were pretty quiet until this bombardment of information from Twitter. Every time I re refresh my Twitter, there was a, another update, another video, another condemnation. But it's very easy to just write a tweet and say that you condemn the violence. It's you need to do something about it. But um, Emma D'Souza, who was on this podcast uh, before, she's been pretty outspoken. She stated that it is reckless to continue to enable the prog prognation of views which serve only to fan the flames of instability and discontent even higher across mainstream mm. media giving a platform to those advocating for the dismantling of the good friday agreement and collapse of structures is not the answer it's not yeah absolutely and you, you'll hear that across the board people are really trying to really just calm this down and there's hope that in the next few days that will happen, given that community activists, youth group leaders, churches are mm. all out on the street yeah. because they had to. No one else was doing it. And I know people who live in Cooper Way there on the Springfield Road who are out at night, what was it two nights ago or one night ago with their family at one in the morning? You know, they didn't feel safe in their home. This is just appalling really to think about this but we do have mechanisms in place that we didn't have originally we do have you know um signatories to the good friday agreement as well so this situation cannot escalate we're in a very different world now people demand more we're in a much more integrated society that's mm -hmm. widely accepted in northern ireland i know we have huge issues yeah. but at the end of the day if you look back to 20 years ago we really are in a different place but I think that broadly speaking, there's still a huge lack of understanding here. And I mean, sometimes we take it for granted. We live here. I don't fully understand everything myself. No. But you do you do see it in the press in particular. And I also think there's a degree of unwillingness to learn both from UK and Ireland yeah, itself. Yeah. There's, you know, there's talk and there's, well, you will talk about this shared island and others. But um, at the, when this first broke, politicians in the south were relatively quiet, quiet on yeah. the matter i know they have come out now and spoke but it's not about hi uh, rioting and i think that's the point it's a much more complex situation as you said highlighting these recurring injustices and inequalities appalling leadership i'm sorry biden has come into the equation as well which is kind of unsurprising yeah so he's probably done the same amount as arlene foster and michelle o'neill send out our condemnation of the, mm, of, the, of violence. the violence. So that's so that he's done the same as the two leaders of the party, and I think th mm. this violence will hopefully calm down. Hopefully, we're into the eighth day, but it will only calm down because of the work of community yeah. representatives. They've been out in the street. I've seen um, local community representatives out dragging away um, barriers that were placed on the road, and okay. they're looking open. They're looking to open community centres and stuff to give these young people some something to do, but. That's that's local people taking into taking it into their own hands because see this childish tweets back yeah. and forth. Oh, this is bad, but not as bad as what what they done or we didn't do that. They did this. That's not going to solve absolutely mm -hmm. anything. And it's it's now onto the local people's hands, which it shouldn't be. As you said, the the Good Friday Agreement. There's mechanisms in place, mm. but before uh, that can ha happen, people need to get to get rid of this bias towards and just solve the problem that's at hand and not yeah. blame anybody else. It is. But again, I mean, this is a sign of our times. 
welcome to post Brexit Mm -hmm. Britain, Northern Ireland, whatever you want to call it. It's up for grabs. It's anyone's taken to submit their opinion now. Remainer, Brexiteer, Unionist, Nationalist, whatever you are. But I think, well, we'll leave it there, Jack, yep. before we go off on I know you can talk about it for hours, rant. but then, yeah. And we will revisit this issue. We've got some fantastic guests coming in who will touch on this. They won't just cover this. They're going to come on and talk about their work. Um, but we really look forward to sharing their views with you from two weeks onwards. And again, ask you to check in to our social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on LinkedIn. And Instagram. Oh, there you go. Instagram as well. Yep. Thanks, Jack, for that. And thank you for joining me again today, our co-host. And he will be back, as we said, and um, more prominent. Yeah, it's good to be back. But he has good been back. For excited for, for the next couple of uh, next couple of weeks for the the guests that are coming on our our great guests. So brilliant okay well thank you everybody for tuning in and we look forward to the weeks ahead bye bye this podcast was recorded in granite podcast studio interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how granite podcast studio can help record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio which is based in the heart of newry city Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.